Good morning, everybody. Hopefully you can hear me. I apologize for yesterday's post when I went back to go over the recording. I noticed it had stopped recording my voice halfway through. So I'm going to redo the lecture today. Hopefully you've already had a chance to look at that one that I had posted. At least I had emailed out the link. If not, no big deal. We're going to go over it again today. I'll try to do some slightly different examples in case you've already seen that. But since I'm a little stressed out about that not picking up my voice, um, somebody let me know, give me a yes in the chat box or say something if you can hear me. Yeah, we can hear you. Perfect. Thank you. I was looking at my chat box saying, okay, come on, somebody, somebody let me know. All right. I appreciate that. We do have 20 participants. I think two of those are me because I'm on my regular screen that I'm writing on and I'm on my screen that I can see what you guys see so that I make sure that I am presenting the correct material. Okay. Anyway, the exam we had last time, the average was um, about an 86, which was pretty high. So hopefully that meant that you guys understood what you were doing. We will go on that assumption at this point. So anyway, what we're doing now is we're going into a new chapter, chapter four. It's the other half of calculus. So the first half of calculus was what they call differential calculus, where we take derivatives we differentiate things. And in that, remember, we were finding the derivative, which was the rate of change of the function. So we were finding how a function changed. We would look at, say, marginal revenue, marginal profit. Marginal profit, of course, is the profit on the next unit we sell. Well, now we're going backwards. Think about marginal revenue. And we say, hey, I know how much revenue I make on the next unit I sell. It's just the selling price. Well, we can use that. That's oftentimes easy to find. I can say, hey, I know if I sell this unit, I make $5. Well, that's actually the derivative that we know. So I can take that derivative, go backwards and find the function itself. Anti-differentiation is just doing that. So we'll say, well, that's not how I want to start. We'll say in anti-differentiation, Not sure why I capitalized that. We go backwards from the derivative to the original function. Okay, that's our whole goal here. So instead of finding instantaneous change, which would be F prime of X, we will find total change in the function. f of x. Okay, so that's what we're looking for now. Total change and the original function. So I'll underline original function up here as well. All right, that's our goal. We're going to talk in here about some notation, what we're looking at, but all the rules that we saw for derivatives, we need to go backwards. The big one, the the power rule, and we'll see that soon. But remember with the power rule, we would bring that exponent down in front and multiply it, and then decrease the exponent by one. We're gonna go the other way. We're gonna increase the exponent by one and divide by whatever that new exponent is. So we'll see that as one of the shortcuts coming up in just a minute. Okay, let's look at some notation for this though.
So remember, we'll say recall so that you know that we've seen this before. If I saw d dx in front of something, that meant take the derivative of whatever's inside there. So that means take derivative. Now what I have in this section and going forward is instead of that d dx, and let me change the color here. Let's see, we'll go to this blue one. I'm going to have this integral sign, they call it. It's from the big, it's from the old fashioned letter S because we're going to see later it stands for the sum of something, but we're going to have that. And at the end, we're going to have a dx, the same dx we had as d dx telling us, hey, x is the variable. So we would say this is the integral with respect to x instead of the derivative with respect to x. So that's what we're talking about there. And then we'll change back to black. And, and it's still, we're taking the integral of something. So this means take antiderivative. Or take integral. We're going to use antiderivative and integral interchangeably. And you'll hear it referred to either way. Okay, so that's the basic idea. So what we're going to do is we're going to use that idea and we're going to build up to what the shortcuts look like. So here's where we go. We're going to say this. Um, consider say I have something like the integral of 3 with respect to x what that's saying is find a function whose derivative is 3 Well, if I do the function f of x equals 3x, that's a function whose derivative is 3. So that works. But it's not the only thing that works. If I took another function, say g of x, and I had 3x plus 7, that also has a derivative of 3. So that also works. But if I had another function, h of x, 3x minus 2, that also has a derivative as 3. And so all of those are correct answers. But notice, all I've done is I've either added or subtracted a constant. I can't put another x there, because if there was another x, then the derivative wouldn't just be 3. So in general... The answer is, let's write down the problem also, the integral of 3 dx. The answer is going to be 3x, but it might be plus some constant c. Because the constant might have been 7, the constant might have been negative 2. For that f of x, that 3x, the constant there would have just been 0, so we wouldn't have seen anything there. And we'll say here, in general, we don't have to say this, notice this isn't in the box, where C is any constant. And then we'll see later in the section we do some applications, we're actually gonna find what that constant is in terms of whatever the problem is. Okay, so that's our basic idea. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you the shortcut rules so that we can look and we can find out, hey, you know, how are we going to do this in general? Do we have any rules for this? And of course we do. So let's say shortcuts for integrals. And again, at this point, if you want to call them antiderivatives, 
as we go further and further, you'll hear them referred to as integrals. And in fact, I had mentioned all the calculus we've done up to this point was called differential calculus. This other half of calculus is called integral calculus. It's not called anti-differential calculus. It's called integral calculus. So integral is what you'll hear quite often. And that little S symbol that I did is called the integral sign. Okay, so here's my first rule. If I have a constant, and we just saw this with the three, if I have the integral of some constant, we'll call it K. Now I know K is not a variable because that DX says X is the variable. So K has to be a constant in this case. Well, we just saw that the antiderivative of K is gonna be K times some X. Because now if I take the derivative of KX, the X goes away, I just get K. But it might be plus some constant. And we usually say plus a constant, we don't say plus or minus because the constant could have been negative too. So as I did before, that three X minus two as an antiderivative, the constant could be plus or minus, it doesn't matter. But we usually write it, we typically just write it as plus C. So there's my first one, that was an easy one, that was constant rule. The next one is the big one that we're gonna do, is the power rule. So now if I have X to some N power, with respect to X, I'm taking the integral. Remember what I do, I'm, I'm gonna add one to that exponent. But instead of multiplying by the exponent, I have to divide by it. Usually they put that as a fraction. Our author puts it as a fraction. This is the way I like it. Some people just put it as a denominator, which I don't like quite as well. And then always plus C. So this was my power rule. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna list all these and then I'll just do examples of all of them. But I want you to have the list all together. Okay. The next one, now we're getting into some special cases. If you remember, we had something that the derivative was one over X. Well, that something, remember, was the LN. And usually they write it as the absolute value of X and then plus C. And the reason for that absolute value is we're gonna see later when we talk about areas, if X is a negative value, I can't take the LN of a negative value. But if I make that negative into a positive, now I can. And what that's gonna do, it's just gonna represent an area that I can actually find. So I would want to be able to find that area even with if X was negative, because it does represent a specific area. Okay, and that's, I'm not gonna name these. I guess if I could, I'll tell you in the book, do they, they just call it the natural logarithm rule. And we also have a rule for the exponential E. So if I have E to the KX DX, again, K must be a constant, because X is the variable. Now, be careful, a lot of students will mess this one up. They wanna do that e to the x like they do the x to the n and drop the power by one. Well, we don't drop the power by one with e to some power. We never did that when we took the derivative. So we're not gonna add one to the exponent here. We still get back, and notice I'm leaving a little room, we still get back e to the kx, just like we always do. If I took the derivative, I'd have to say times k, because of the chain rule, but I'm not taking the derivative, I'm going backwards. So instead of times K, I divide by K. So we usually put one over K in the front. We do the reciprocal and again, plus C. And we'll show all these as we get a little bit further. I'll show where we take the derivative. We see how oh yeah, we actually do get that as the derivative, what I originally started with. And the other two aren't really rules, they're properties, but I'll just list them here so that we have them. One is similar to the constant rule that we had, where I, if I have a constant times some function f of x dx. Remember, the constant multiple rule with multiplication, 
when we're taking derivatives said, oh, I can keep the constant there and then just take the derivative of the function. Well, I can do the same thing with integrals. I can keep the constant times the integral of the function. So just like derivatives, the constant multiple stays. And then lastly, if I'm taking the integral of either two functions added together or subtracted, I can just take the integral of each one individually and then add or subtract. Let me move this up. So I could take the integral of f of x dx and then either add or subtract whatever the question's asking for. Oops, the integral of gx dx. Okay, so those are my six rules and properties. And so now we're just gonna do a bunch of examples. So let me see. I don't know why my chat window is not working in my other box. Um, yeah, mine's not working either. I only can send you a private message. I can't do a to everyone or. No. Oh, that is really weird. Oh, that's why I can't see anything in my in my other box. I only can send what, it to you. What if I wonder if there's a setting on my side? I can just a question out loud. It's fine. Right, but not everybody has a microphone. Ah, uh, true. Is the problem. So, but you are absolutely right. Um, let's see. So that's where I'm, I'm getting all the I can hear you's, which is very nice. Okay. So I, can, I can't see that since they're private messages, I can't see them on my other screen because I'm just logged in as student but I can see them here. Um, and there is something for multiplication and division, but, and we are actually going to do the one for multiplication. We don't do the one for division. That's something that we don't really need to see at this level of calculus. Um, it is in the book. It's not in this section though. So the one for multiplication is called, um, integration by substitution, which we will do. Uh -huh. The one for division is called integration by parts, and we're actually skipping that section. That's just, I felt that's just beyond what we need to do. So, but there are things for those. And we actually have something that's similar to the chain rule, which is called, um, which is called, what's it called? U substitution, not U substitution. Man, it's, it's skipping me at this point. Okay, so let's do examples of each of these so you know. So anyway, just so you know, if you do private message me, now I know that I just need to open it up on my, my main screen. But I don't know, I wonder if when I set it up, there was something that said I, you could only private message me. I don't see anything there. I did notice, I don't know. I noticed on my other screen, it said, if I were to put in a message there, a chat, then it was going to just me privately. But I didn't realize that meant that somehow it's set up that that's all anybody can do. All right. So we will go back to looking at some examples. All right. So as an example, Let's say we have the integral of six with respect to x. Now again, we're trying to find something whose derivative is six. Well, that's just gonna be six x. And it might be plus or minus some number, so we're gonna say plus c, and we're done. That's as quick as that. And the reason that works though is since this is how we would check if I take the derivative of 6x plus c I get 6 plus 0 for the constant so I just get 6 and yeah that's that's what I started with that's this right here so these need to match up whatever I'm taking the, the 
integral or the antiderivative of, that has to be the derivative of whatever my answer is. So notice those do check. And so that's one of the things that's nice about anti-differentiation is we can always check our answer by taking the derivative and making sure we get the same thing. All right, I'm gonna erase those blue circles. All right, so let's just go a step from there. If I have, say, the integral of x to the fourth power with respect to x. Well, remember, with derivatives, I'd drop that four by one to a three. I'd bring the four down and then make, make it a three. But instead of dropping it by one, I'm gonna add one to it. And I divide by whatever that new exponent is. Now, I'm going to write it out this way, and we'll do that most of today. But ideally, in your head, you'll just say, oh, that's x to the fifth, because I add one, and I divide by five or multiply by one-fifth. And so you'll skip that middle step, go straight there, and then do your plus c, and you're done. Again, we'll check real quickly, because that seems weird. So I check by taking the derivative. 1 fifth x to the fifth plus c. Well, remember that constant multiple, the 1 fifth stays, but then I take the derivative of the 5, or the x to the fifth, which gives me 5x to the fourth, and then plus 0 for the c. Well, that 1 fifth canceled out the 5 that came down. And so we just get x to the fourth, which checks off as what we started with. But that's why we always put that reciprocal in front because it's going to cancel that new exponent once I take the derivative. And so again, ideally, when you see x to the fourth, you'll say, oh, I know that's going to be an x to the fifth, so it's one-fifth x to the fifth plus c. But that's why, because we're adding one to the exponent. So that's the power rule. And then we'll go to this next rule. So if I have the antiderivative of let's say x to the negative one power. Realize x to the negative one is the same thing as one over x dx. And so if you see it in either of those two forms, just realize, oh, that's just ln of the absolute value of x plus c. Again, we're not doing much with the absolute value right now, but we will later. Okay. And again, I'm not going to write out the check, but we all know that the derivative of ln of x is just 1 over x, which can be written as x to the negative 1. And then, of course, the plus c goes away. And then similarly, say I have the antiderivative e to the 4x with respect to x. Now, again, don't get caught up and say, oh, I need to add one to that exponent. You add one to the exponent if it's just a constant. You don't do it if there's a variable up there. So this is an exponential function, not a power function. So think about taking the derivative. If I took the derivative, I'd get e to the 4x times 4 because of the chain rule. I'm not doing the derivative and going backwards. So the only thing that's going to change is instead of multiplying by this 4, I'm going to divide by that 4. So when I do this, what I'm going to get back, I'm going to get back my e to the 4x. Just like when I took the derivative, I get back the entire exponential. But instead of saying times 4, I say, oh, divided by 4. That's supposed to be a dot. The dot looks horrible. I'll just put the 1 4 there. Oh. Get rid of my whole e. So it's 1 fourth e to the 4x, again, plus c, and that's my answer. And again, this one, if you want to check, it's real quick to check. I would take the derivative of that whole thing. So I'd get the 1 fourth constant multiple, e to the 4x, but then times 4 because of the chain rule plus zero because the derivative of a constant, and then this four and this one fourth cancel each other out. We just get e to the four x. Check. And again, that's what I started with, so we know that's the right answer. Okay, so those are 
the basic one, those two other properties that I showed you. So let's look, for instance, at the power rule or the, the constant multiple rule, rather. So now say I have 8x squared dx. I can think in my head, I usually don't write this out, but we're just going to look at the x squared dx. So the 8 is still going to trail along. It's going to multiply by the answer. But again, in my head, I'm not doing that. I'm just saying, okay, the 8 still here. The x goes up to up by 1, and I have to divide by whatever that is, plus c. So what I'm getting is I'm getting 8 times 1 third x to the third, plus c. And then usually, since that's really 8 over 1, we would multiply those fractions together and get 8 thirds x to the third plus C. And so had that been a one-half or a one-fourth, I would actually go through and reduce the 8. But this case, I can't, so I just leave it as an improper fraction. Okay, so that's all that constant multiple one is. And then lastly, if I have two things I'm adding up, say I have, well, let's, let's go with X cubed plus e to the 2x. So now I've got a couple things here. And then that property was just saying, oh, we can treat these separately. Don't think about this whole thing as, wow, how do I do this whole big long thing? We just say, oh, it's the integral of x cubed dx plus the integral of e to the 2x dx. And then you do them separately. We still have to do them. We haven't we don't get out of that. So remember, let me show you just the shortcut, how I'd like you to think about that. That x to the third is going to go up by one, so it's going to be x to the fourth, and then just multiply by the reciprocal. The e to the 2x, we get back the e to the 2x, but with derivatives, we'd say times 2 because of the chain rule. So now we're going to divide by 2. And then... How did you get the 1 fourth? With the taking this piece right here, remember what I do is I add one to the exponent and then I divide by whatever that new exponent is. So those went up to fours. And so that was a one fourth. So remember with anti differentiation, you just go up one with the exponent instead of down one. So I'm concentrating on the exponent first. I go up one on the exponent and then divide by that new exponent. So you should have the reciprocal of whatever you have in your answer as the exponent. That as a fraction flipped over should be what the coefficient is. I thought you'd do the one half divided by e to the two x. So I'm looking back at the notes. You did one, like, one of the examples just by itself. What do you mean by one? What do you mean by one half divided by like one half divided? So by, one on half? one of the no the the first one you wrote right here. Right um, here. it's not supposed to be a divided by. It's supposed to be times. Oh, then I I misunderstood I mis okay. misunderstood you. I thought you said divide back up there. Okay. Oh no! Here's the we're not dividing by the one half. We're dividing by the two. Because the uh, chain okay. times two. So when I said divide by two, so if I write this, that's the same as dividing by two. You may, some authors actually put it where it's divided by two this way. And then we do literally see it as divided by two. Okay. But I'm doing my divided by two is multiplying by a half. I, I definitely see where that, the way I, I posed that could definitely lead to confusion. But yeah, either of these, these are both equivalent, multiply by half or divide by two. Okay. All right, so let me erase some of that stuff so it doesn't, so if anybody looks back over this, they're like, where'd that come from? All right. We'll leave that up there though, because that was, that was good. So those are all of our properties, all of our shortcuts. And so what we'll do is let me just show you a couple more examples of some things in here 
I'll pull a couple problems out of the book and then we'll look at what to do with that C. So let me see if I can see some things that are what I consider interesting. Hey, let's do problem 10 out of the book because it's got a lot of steps to it, but I think you'll see that it's pretty quick. So I've got 3t squared minus 4t plus 7. And so there's a lot of steps here. Now we have to say dt with respect to t because t this time is the variable. And so I'm not going to write it out as three separate integrals, but notice the first thing I'm doing is I'm using that property that says, oh, if you're subtracting two different terms, then you can do each one separately. If you're adding different terms, you can do them separately. So in my head, I'm breaking this up as three different integrals. I'm not going to write it because I think that just makes it look more confusing. But now I'm going to take each of these individually. So that first one, the three is going to stay. It's a constant multiple. The exponent goes up by one, but then I have to go one over whatever that new exponent is. Let's not skip that step. It's two plus one. I do the same thing with the four. It stays. It's a constant multiple. The t, right now it's a first power. It goes up by one, but then I multiply by the reciprocal of that as well. At times. And then the seven's a constant. We have to put a t on it, and then we have to put plus c. Now, what I've done there is I've done the constant rule, I've done the power rule, I've done the constant multiple rule, and I've done the add or subtract. So I've done four different properties in this one problem. And we'll just clean everything up. Notice this is a three times one third t to the third minus four times one half t to the second plus seven t plus c. And then I can reduce all these. Obviously this three cancels that three. Two goes into four twice. And then my answer is just t cubed minus 2t squared plus 7t plus c. Lots of pieces, a lot of moving parts there. But what I'll do is I'll take the derivative to show that it actually is what was inside the parentheses. So let's check. Again, that's one of the nice things about this. They're quick to check. So let's say check. And I take the derivative with respect to t, t to the third minus 2t squared plus 7t plus c. So that t to the third, I get 3t squared. And then negative 2t squared, I get minus 4t. And then plus 7, the constant goes to 0. And then check, that's what I started out with originally in the box. And I had a question, why do we put C instead of X? Well, because if it was an X, then when I took the derivative, I'd get a 1. So the plus C is because when I take the derivative, I get a 0. And any constant, when I take the derivative of it, will give me back to the original function. So the basic idea, remember, of this is if I know the derivative, such as the marginal profit, I can take that and I can go backwards to the profit function. And so just from the derivative, I can find things like, hey, how much total profit do we make from increasing sales from 100 to 200 units? So in business, a lot of times it's easy to find the derivative, to have the derivative, and we don't actually have the original function. This allows me to go backwards to the original function, create the original function from the derivative, and then find the total change. Okay, so we'll go from there. Um, another example I want to show you, let's look at We'll jump ahead at one of these. If I do problem 24, it's written this way and it looks kind of crazy. 
it's a fraction. Five is the numerator. The denominator is the fourth root of x to the third with respect to x. Now, that looks horrible, and it looks like something we may have to use a quotient rule type of thing to. But notice, I can rewrite this as fractional exponents. So I'm thinking this, that x to the third, that stays, but the fourth root becomes a four denominator for a fractional exponent. And then further, I can bring that up to the top by making that a negative three-fourths exponent. And so just like in derivatives, anytime we see denominators with x's or we see radicals, this time we had both, then we can change it to just an exponent so we can use the power rule. And so now we're going to use the power rule again to take that antiderivative. The 5 is a constant multiple. It stays. The x, remember what happens is it goes up by 1 for the power. And then I'm going to have 1 over whatever that new power is. Again, I usually don't write out these steps. Today's the last day I'll write out the steps because it just looks really confusing that way. But think what's happening here. This 1 is really a 4 over 4. We'll do that so that we can get a common denominator so we can add those up. So that new exponent, I have 5 times, leave that blank for a second. This new exponent, negative 3 fourths plus 4 fourths is 1 fourth. So what I'm going to do in front, remember, we always put the reciprocal there. Well, the reciprocal is 4 over 1. Now, this whole piece, if I looked at it, would have been 1 over 1 fourth. But remember, to solve that, it's 1 times 4 over 1, which is just the 4 over 1 or the 4. So that's why here... Uh-oh, I forgot to put my plus C a couple places. So here, my answer is just going to be 20 X to the 1 fourth plus C. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to check that to make sure it's the right answer. Because there's a lot going on there. So let's look. So again, check. We'll take the derivative with respect to X. 20x to the 1 fourth, much easier to check because we're good with derivatives. So we've got that 20, we bring down that 1 fourth x, we drop that by 1, which makes it a 3 fourths, negative 3 fourths, and then plus 0, of course. And then 1 fourth of 20 is 5, so we have 5x to the negative 3 fourths, which is 5 over x to the 3 fourths, which should I keep going? Which is really 5 over the fourth root of x to the third. So if we want to make it look exactly like the original problem, we can. But several steps, because we have to remember all our properties of exponents, and not the properties, but the, the negative exponents, the fractional exponents, all of that. So that one kind of a bit involved with all those fractions. Let's look at a simpler one. We'll do it in two pieces so that we can get a little more practice on that. We'll just call it example. I'll just make this one up. So what if I have 1 over x to the fifth, and then we'll say minus the square root of x. So there's one. That'll give us both the negative exponents and the fractional exponent practice. Because if I rewrite this, that's x to the negative 5 minus x to the one half power. So remember the square root's the one half. And then now I just have power rule. So when I do the power rule, I go up by one and then I do one over whatever that new word is. I go up by one and then I do one over whatever that new exponent is. And when you start just going up by one in your head, and then just adding those, then it makes the problem look a lot simpler because you you're not writing out all that, all those steps. But 
And again, I focus on the exponent. So x to the negative five plus one is x to the negative four. So that just means this is one over negative four. Minus one half plus one, again, that's two over two. So that's three halves. So I get x to the three halves. I just multiply by the reciprocal, two thirds. And then I have my plus c. I'm actually done there. Again, practice these when I give you some practice problems for the next test to see, I would assume the calculator accepts the computer, accepts that negative one fourth x to the negative four, but I don't know. They may do something like this. Um, negative one over four x to the fourth. That's equivalent minus, and then I don't know if they'd want to put that as a radical or not. If they did, we would do this. Let's write it. Two over, it's the square root of x to the third over three plus c. And again, I don't think we have to go that far, but that is equivalent. So I got a, a question. Can you put up the practice test early or a question from each chapter to practice on top of homework? Well, the, what I do when I go make the practice test, it's going to be just like the homework problems because I, I'm the one that picked out the homework problems. And obviously I'm the same one that picks out the practice test problems. So at this point until the practice get, test gets up, because I don't, I will tell you, I don't know how early I'm going to be able to get that up. At this point, just do the practice, just do the homework problems in the syllabus. I think that would be your, your best bet at this point. But I will get, so there's no additional problems from homework that I would assign over the homework problems. It's just practicing them in the computer format once the, once the practice test gets up there or the practice problems. All right, so now what we're gonna do, we're gonna look and see how to deal with that constant C. So let's do, we'll do a warm up problem and then we'll do a couple applications. And it's the same applications I did on what I sent you the link to, although this time hopefully you'll be able to hear me speak. And I, I'm hoping I accidentally hit the mute button I'm hoping it, it wasn't a computer problem I'm having, because if so, then I never know when it's going to work or not. I hope it, I hope it was just operator error. That's my, that's my goal. Okay, so let's move on. We'll go to one of these. Let's go ahead and do, it's problem 54 out of our book. Now, one thing I want to tell you, on some of the problems when I post, oh, this is sort of an issue for, for some of you. I'm using the old edition of the book. So when I say problem 54, it's problem 54 out of the old edition of the book, which if you had bought the book in the bookstore, this is the book that they had. This is the book we're using. If you're looking at the e-text, so if you just waited until you got the e-text and now you're able to look at the book because you hadn't bought a book, the e-text for my math lab doesn't go back to the old edition. There's a new edition that's out. I didn't want to change to it in the fall because I was afraid we wouldn't be able to get copies of it in the fall. You've probably been in classes where, oh, there's a new edition of the book coming out. Oh, we're not going to get it for a month. Like, well, that to me was not acceptable. So that's why we stayed with the old edition of the book. So sometimes my numbers that I put on here, if you're looking at the e-text, won't match. Similarly, when I pull a problem to post, like an application, on here when I'm doing a lecture, it's coming from the new edition. So the numbering, even the problem itself, might be different than what you have in the physical book. So realize there's kind of a, a discrepancy between problem numbers, which sort of comes into play because if you're looking at what I have assigned on the homework, 
but you're using the e-text, the numbering might be different. What edition is the new book and the old book? The old book is edition 11. That's what I have. And I have... Uh, no, no, I understand because you have the book. So, but if you look at the e-text online, it's edition 12. Oh, uh, okay. So anybody that didn't have the old edition, Anybody that didn't have the old edition, they're looking at the e-text. Some of the numberings, are, some of the numberings are going to be wrong. Um, so, in the book eleven edition, number fifty-four shouldn't be a word problem, correct? Um, I don't know, but I'll I'll show you when I get to a word problem. I'll post a word problem. Um, and somebody said, I believe it's chapter four for antiderivatives in the ebook. And so chapter wise, we should be okay because it is chapter four in the new book as well. It's just some of the problem numbering will be different. So when I say 54, if you look in the ebook, this might not be your problem. So we have, they give us the derivative is six X squared minus four X plus two. They also tell us that f of 1 is equal to 9. We're going to use this to find c. Okay. And the question just says, find the function. It just says, find f. But we'll say, find function f. That's, that's the instructions. So the function f... And this is actually the fundamental theorem of calculus, which we're going to see later, but it probably makes sense to you now. The function itself is going to be the antiderivative of the derivative. That's the idea behind this problem. So we need to take the antiderivative of 6x squared minus 4x plus 2 to find the function itself. And so remember, here's what we do. I'm going to try to go... I'm going to try to skip that step. That x to the second, remember, we go up one in the exponent. So we've got that six here. We go up, up one in the exponent. That's become a three. So in front, I put a one-third. Because just that piece right there, if I do the three times one-third x, I'm going to get the three and the one-third cancel out. I just get x to the second if I take the derivative. So we'll check this in our head once we do it. With the four stays, the x goes up to a two exponent, but then I have to multiply by a one half. And then this two goes to a two x plus c. And so that six times one third just becomes two x cubed minus half of four is two x squared and I put that as a times instead of a plus 2x plus c. Now, in our head, let's just check to make sure what the derivative is. So if I take the derivative, I get 6x squared. Well, that's right. If we look back up to the derivative, I get minus 4x, which is right. And I get plus 2. So if I take the derivative of that, I do get what they told me up here the derivative was. All right, so I know I'm on the right track. I know I have the right derivative. Now what we're going to do is we're going to use that f of 1 equals 9 to get our answer. So it says when x is 1, the function value is 9. So this is going to be a 9. Let me move that up. This is going to be a 9, the function value, when x is 1. So I plug in 1 for all my x's. And then I just work that out to figure out what C is. So I do that. One cubed, of course, is still one times two is just two. So I get two minus two, because again, one squared is one times two is two, plus two plus C. Those two cancel out. I get nine equals two plus C. Subtract two, I get seven is equal to C. And now I can write my problem because remember, I knew the function was that. Now I know C is 7. I'll just plug that in there. 
And so my function, my final answer, f of x equals, what I had found is the antiderivative, 2x cubed minus 2x squared plus 2x, but instead of plus c, we know c is 7. And now I've got my function. I was wondering if you'd explain why, so for this application, we end up taking the, or the antiderivative um, from like our original, why, why we choose to take that. Because they wanted the original function and all we had was the derivative. So we have to take the derivative, anti-differentiate it to get back to the original function. So the antiderivative of the derivative is the function itself. And I was trying to find the function itself, which is why I had to go backwards. Does that make any sense at all? I, I believe so, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, it, it's, it's kind of similar to what we had to do on like the practice problems for the test where we had to kind of go back and plug it into the original function, except now it's more solved. Right, but we didn't know what the original, in this problem, we don't know what the original function is. So they're saying, hey, ah, okay. here's, here's the derivative of some function. And we say, well, if that's the derivative, the original function must have been, and that's what we have in the box, is what the original function was that had the derivative they told us and also had f of 1 was equal to 9. So if I plug 1 in for x there, I'm going to get 9 as my answer. So it satisfies both of those requirements. So what I have in the box right there, what it does is if I come back up here, it does have this derivative. And if I plug in one for X, I do get nine for the function value. So that what I have in the box satisfies both of those conditions. It's not a very good check mark. So that's what I was trying to do is I was just trying to find the function that had both of those qualities. Okay, so let's do a couple examples from the book. And what I'm going to do is, if I can, is I'm going to put them here so you can actually read the problem. And I kind of like this part about doing this online because you guys have all the work. I can even show you the actual problem. So what I'm going to do, and I'll, I'll refer to the numbers here. So if I pull out, where's my problems? If I pull out these problems, I'm going to copy this one, and then I'm going to post it back into my work. So I'm going to post it right here. Paste. So now notice, oh, here's a problem. So I don't have to just read the problem from the board and you're thinking, oh, well, I've, I've never actually read a problem. So here's the problem, and this is what I was going to say. In the new book, this is problem 64. In the old book, it's problem 65. So there's some differences in numbering of problems. The sections usually stay the same, but so in the old edition of the book, so if you have the book from the class, this is problem 65. But if you have it on the e-text in the new edition of the book, it's problem 64. Regardless, we're going to do it. Okay. So it says demand for marginal demand. So what we're trying to find is the demand function, but all we have is the derivative, marginal demand. It says Lassard and Company finds that the rate that, at which the quantity of flameless candles that consumers demand changes with respect to price is given by the marginal demand function d prime of x equals negative 4,000 over x squared. Where notice x is the price per candle in dollars. Find the demand function if 1,003 candles are demanded by consumers when the price is $4 per candle. So if I look down here and it says 1,003 candles are demanded when the price is $4 per candle. What that's telling me, it says the demand at $4 is 1,003. And so we're going to use that. That's what we're going to use to find C. All right. So we want to find the original function. Well, 
the original function, the demand function, remember, the demand function is going to be the antiderivative of the derivative. So the antiderivative cancels out the derivative and gives us back our original function. Now, I'm going to rewrite that d prime as the integral of negative 4,000, but since I have that x squared on the bottom, x to the negative 2. And now I can just use my power rule. So I'm not going to skip the step of adding one to the exponent because with a negative exponent, it's a little bit harder. So my demand function is I keep the constant multiple, negative 4,000. My exponent goes up by one. So I add one there and then I divide by whatever that is or multiply by the reciprocal. And then plus C. Okay, so notice what that really is. It's negative 4,000. And then that's just one over negative one, x to the negative one plus C. So this negative here is gonna cancel with that negative there. So we're gonna get a positive. So my demand function is actually gonna be 4,000 x to the negative one plus C. You can leave it that way. I'm probably gonna think of it that x to the negative one just going to the bottom. That seems like an easier way to look at the function. Were I writing the function out as the demand function, I would use it that way. So that's what we're gonna use. And we're done except for finding the value of c. So now we're gonna use this stuff over here and plug it in and see what's going on. Okay, so my demand function equals 1,003. That's my demand when x is four. And again, I'm just trying to figure out what c is. So I get 1,003 equals 1,000 plus c, and I subtract the 1,000, I just get three. And now I can do my function because I'm going to bring this down and I'm going to say, oh, my demand function d of x is 4,000 over x plus 3. And I have my demand function. Now if they said, oh, find the demand at $10 a unit. Oh, I just plug in 10 and I'd get 400 plus 3. I'd get 403 would be my demand if I increase the price to 10. So I can find the demand now for any value that I want to. And again, that's the power, that's the reason we're finding antiderivatives. Because, oh, now I've got the original function. And now I can find total change. Now if I wanted to find like the price to maximize revenue, then I don't want the demand function. I want the derivative of demand. I want the marginal demand function because I can set that equal to zero and solve. But if I want to say, well, what's the total demand? I don't care what happens if I add one more dollar in price. I want to know what the total demand is if the price is $20. Oh, I just plug in 20 here. It's 4,000 divided by 20 plus three. If I only had the derivative and I plugged in 20, it would tell me what would happen. What's the change in demand if I increase price to $21? That's not my interest right now. I need to go tell production how many units to make because I'm planning on a certain price and I want to know what the demand is going to be. All right, let's go on to this last problem. Another application, again, a different number from the two additions. So let's see. So let me click here. Yeah, it should work. And let me go pull that problem up. I've got it right here. So let's copy and paste this one. This one even comes with a picture attached. Very cool. Um, copy. And we'll paste that in right about here. Okay. So we've got somebody that is working, looks like a welder to me. 
says efficiency of a marine of a machine operator. The rate at which a machine operator's efficiency E expressed as a percentage changes with respect to time is given by DE dt is 30 minus 10 T. Now the DE dt that's the change in efficiency over the change in time. Remember the derivative stands for a specific rate of change where T is the number of hours worked by the operator. So notice if we plug in a zero there, well that's the derivative. That's not going to tell us a whole bunch, but if I plug in a zero right there, 30 minus zero is just 30. They're saying, oh, in the first hour, the efficiency goes up by 30%. So they're getting more efficient once they start to get warmed up. But we want to ask a different question. So part A says find E of T given the operator's efficiency after working two hours is 72%. That is, and they tell us, oh, look, E of 2 is 72. I tried to change that to blue. It didn't work. All right. So we want to find E of T. So find E of T given E of 2 equals 72. So that E of 2 equals 72, that means when this operator has been working for two hours, their efficiency is 72% of their maximum efficiency. That's what that means. Okay, so again, E of T is going to be the antiderivative of the DE dt. Respect to time. Those essentially cancel each other out. So I'm just taking the integral of 30 minus 10t. Well, it's, it's a weird looking zero. 30 minus, uh, I'm back to my eraser, minus 10t with respect to t. Well, that's going to be a much easier antiderivative. So I'm going to get my e of t, my efficiency after time t, is 30t. Remember, add the t. The exponents, it's going to go up by 1, and then we do 1 over that same number, plus c. So this gives me I'm not going to rewrite another line of this. I'm just going to write. So notice that's a one half times 10. It's just a five T squared. Are you not going to have two C's in there because there's two? Oh, that's a good question. We don't need to because remember C is just any constant. So if I had C1, for instance, for the first one and C2 for the next one, if I add those together, it's still a constant. So regardless of what those constants were, because if I have the 30 giving me a, a 30t plus c, and then the negative 10t giving me a negative 5t squared plus c, those two c's still added together are still a constant. We still don't know what the constant is, and we wouldn't be able to break it up between the two anyway. So the short answer to your question is no, we don't need to put two different C's there because it's still just a constant. Oh, that makes sense. Thank you. You're welcome. And I like to give a little explanation to it because I know, I know personally, if somebody says, oh, you just do it because that's the way it's done. It's like, well, no, I'm not going to do it. So, but that's why. I'm, I'm always a, I want to understand why. I used to. I feel that, yeah. I, <laughs> I used to take my dog for a walk, and, and he loves to run. And I had hurt my knee for a while, so I was on my bike. And I'd go out on the, we have this little hiking trail. And it says, no bikes. And I'm like, no bikes, that's stupid. And then I was reading the community newsletter one day, and it says, oh, don't ride bikes on the trail because it leaves ruts in the decomposed granite and ruins the trail. I was like, oh yeah, I probably shouldn't do that. So now I don't ride the bike on the trail anymore, but it's because it wasn't an arbitrary rule. There was a reason for it. That's why I like to explain reasons for things, even though sometimes students just want a yes or no answer. I apologize for that. Um, why so is some, the most important question? I'll say that. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's why you asked the question. That makes sense. Okay, so I have my function here. I still need to find what C is. 
And remember, they told me this. Apparently, I'm still in the eraser. They told me that E of 2 is 72. So the efficiency level is 72 when T is 2. So I plug in a 2 wherever I see a T. And my answer has to be 72. And so that's going to allow me to find C. No fractions this time. This will be a lot nicer. So I get 72 equals 60. 2 squared is 4 times 5 is 20. Remember, exponents before multiplication. And the, again, the reason for that is that 2 exponent doesn't relate to the 5, just the 2. So don't multiply the 5 and the 2 and get 10 and then square it and get 100. You're going to get negative efficiency, which you can't have a negative efficiency. Even if you're just lying there asleep, your efficiency is zero, but it's not negative. So anyway, I get that. So 60 minus 20, of course, is 40. So 72 equals 40 plus C. I'll subtract the 40, and I get 32 is equal to C. And so my function, that's going to go right there. So my efficiency function is 30T minus 5T squared. Ugh, can't handle it. Minus 5T squared plus 32. And notice that 32, that's my starting value. If T is zero, then the first two pieces drop away. And I just get my efficiency at zero hours is 32. So when that operator walks in the door, they're only at 32% of their maximum efficiency. Move up this way. All right. So now we've got the answer. That's the answer to part A. And then we can go to B. Hopefully I'm not moving that too far. And then on part B, it says use the answer to A to find the operator's efficiency after two after three hours and after five hours. So after three hours, that's just the efficiency after three hours. We just plug in a three. So 30 times three minus five times three squared plus 32. And now I'm just calculating these. So let's see, 30 times three is 90 minus, that's 5 times 9, so 45, plus 32, which gives me 45 plus 32, which is 77. So after three hours, the operator's at 77% efficiency. And then after five hours, Now you just plug in a five, of course. And so I've got 150. Wow, he's very efficient. Oh, but now minus five squared is 25 times five is 125. Well, that took most of that away, plus 32. Well, the 150 minus 125 is 25. 25 plus 32 is 57. Uh-oh. 20% less efficient after five hours than they were at three hours. And so that gives us the efficiency. So just to write one of these in words, after five hours, the machine operator is working at 57% efficiency. And if we wanted to find when they were most efficient, we didn't need the original function at all. We would have used the derivative, set that equal to zero and solved it and figured out when they were most efficient. And that's easy to do. We could probably do that in our head. Let me slide there real quickly. So the original function was 30 minus 10t. If we set that equal to zero, add the 10t, we get 30 equals 10t. 
divide by 10, we get t equals three. So they were most efficient at three hours. Again, I haven't checked that yet. I would have to check to verify that was a max, but it's my only critical value. And I knew after five hours, it was less. So it couldn't have been a min, had to have been a max, unless it was an inflection point. So I would have to check. Now, just so you all know, I have a question about the next test. It will be in the same format. So the next test and the final, we have, and in fact, at the school, we've been informed that the rest of this semester and all of summer are going to be completely online. So we're even, wow. yeah, there's even some discussion about if spring is going to start or be completely online. So there's no official word yet. I think it's premature to say we would even start online since there's so many months before fall starts. But they have made the decision that for summer, it's going to be completely online. How is statistics online? Is it more difficult because, or is it as the same? Well, the, it, it depends. If when I used to teach online classes, I would leave most of it up to the students. But if you take one of the classes that was supposed to be an in-class class, then they should be doing not necessarily what I'm doing, but something similar. You should be meeting during regular class hours, having live sessions type of thing. They wouldn't necessarily be posting videos ahead of time, but you should still be meeting with your teacher during the regular time, which if it's a straight, if it's scheduled as an online class without hours on the schedule, say for summer, then in that case, there's no specific meeting times with the teacher. And that would be more difficult to learn because you don't really have anybody to ask questions. You could ask questions periodically. Um, but so a traditional online versus just, we're going to run this on-campus class in an online format, but we're still going to meet at the same times is hopefully going to be similar to being in class. Hopefully that answered that question. Sorry, could, could, you, uh, could you repeat that one more time? <laughs> I'm sorry. I like, I like missed that. If you <laughs> sign up for a class that's scheduled to be online, then you don't have any regular meeting hours with the teacher. But if the class is, say, over the summer, it was scheduled Monday, Wednesday from 2 to 4. You still meet online with your teacher Monday, Wednesday from 2 to 4. So you still have that, that interaction ah. and the teacher teaching. So that's not, it should be, you know, somewhat similar to what we're doing in this class. But if it's scheduled as an online class, there's no scheduled time to actually meet with or talk to the teacher. And so it's, it's very limited interaction. Oh, okay. Okay. They don't Thank usually you. have that for math classes. Usually it's more interactive, correct? Yeah, we have, we have very few online math classes that we offer. Right now, most of the online classes will have some of the remedial, like the elementary and intermediate algebra classes, but we do have statistics and college algebra both offered in an online format as well. In fact, I'm doing college algebra this summer as an online course, and I'm feeling like I should do some of these videos like I do now. In the past, I didn't do anything. I'd say, oh, look at the, the videos done by the, um, the publisher but I may have to step up my game <laughs> and, and be more interactive with the students. So did they tell you about anything about the graduation? Are they just going to send out a diploma and that's it? I have heard there's talk about doing a kind of a Zoom graduation, okay. um, but I don't think anything's formalized right now. But I, one of the committees, one of my math faculty went to, they sent us a, an email update and said they are looking into the possibility of, of doing something online, doing a virtual graduation so that students don't miss out on their graduation. For the, for the upcoming two tests, we, you're basically, we have one more test and then we have the final and you're dropping one of those tests. If your final's better. Yes. If so, your finals, okay. 
Yeah, so if your final's not your lowest grade, then I will count your final for the final, but I will also count the final score, your percentage, for to replace your lowest test as well. Oh, how so much it, is the final worth like it, in points? It, 100 points. It's the same oh. as any other test. Okay. So if your final is your lowest test, it still counts as a 100-point test. So it doesn't count any more than, say, exam one. It counts the same, but it can count double and then drop your lowest test if the final is not your lowest test. So if the final is your lowest test, it, it's nothing changes? It's just how no, it it's, is? Right, but it's, well, here's the idea. We have five scores that make up your grade. So think we have, we have the four exams, and then the final is the fifth score. So it does count as one-fifth of your grade. But if you have a test score that was lower than your final, now I'm going to drop that, count the final twice. So you'd use your three highest regular exams plus the final twice as your 500 points. So it, does, it counts as a minimum of 100 points, but it could count up to 200 points and then drop your low test. So if your final is your lowest test, it doesn't change. You, you don't get like another test doubled or something. No, that's correct. Okay. okay. Yeah. It's still, if it's your lowest test, it's still going to drop your average because we still figure it in as one of your five tests. So yeah. when you say it doesn't change anything, I didn't want you to think, oh, I'm going into the final with an 80 and I got a 60 on the final. I still keep an 80. No, you don't keep an 80 because that 60 brought you down. Okay. Excellent. All right. Any other questions before we sign off for the day? Yes. And I, um, and sorry, I'll leave you finish. Sorry. Yeah, I, <laughs> no, that was my fault because I asked any questions and then I started talking. Um, so I will, I've been recording this. So I will, once the recording's up, I will send this out. I will, uh, probably what I'm going to do since I don't have anything up on my, YouTube channel for this section. I'll probably post this as a YouTube um, and I'll send you either, well, I'll probably send you the link to the YouTube channel so you can see it on there, but I will, you will have access to this. And I'm sorry, go ahead. So did you end up going over the, this is just particularly to me, no one else, but do you go over the test? I sent you a question in the beginning. Uh, yeah, email me again, because I, I think I did, but email me again with those problems to look at um, cause I, cause I had a few people that emailed me and I looked at some problems and I thought I'd looked at yours, but send me the numbers again and I'll just, I'll make sure I did. Cause I don't see that, that email in my, my inbox anymore. Okay. I'm going to resend it right now. Perfect. Okay. What about anything else going on? Anybody have anything that they want to? Let me know about, oh, I see there's something in my chat box. I forgot to check. Let's see. Yes, the final is cumulative. So if you, on the syllabus, what you'll see is that exam four is on May 11th. The final is exactly one week after that. So there's no new material on the final. The final is just problems off your first four exams. And there may be a, you know, I may throw something in that I think this problem is this asking the same type of question. So it may be, oh, here's a, an application of maximizing revenue. And you're like, well, we didn't have this specific maximizing revenue. And I'd say, well, that's true, but it's still a maximizing revenue problem. So the final is cumulative. There's nothing new on it as far as new material we would have already been tested over all the material once we get through exam four. So it's not cumulative. I mean, excuse me, it is cumulative, but there's no new material on it. Um, I don't know how many questions on the final. It's going to be, we still only get the same amount of time for the final as we did for the regular tests. So it's going to be about the same length as you'll see on the last test and on exam four. Will we get um, a practice test for the final? No. 
And the reason is your practice test would be looking at the first two tests we took in class and exam three and four from uh, what we took online. So you'll have, I won't narrow it down past that. So it'll be, it'll be narrowed down to everything we've seen on exams. So you don't have to go and look at, you know, a bunch of new stuff, but I will not give a practice exam for the final. Are you doing a review for the final? Yeah, our last, okay. yeah, our last regular class um, on the 13th will be review for the final. So we'll have exam four on the 11th and then we'll review on the 13th. And I'll probably do something again where I had that, that office hour on Saturday. We may do something like that again um, for the final so that you guys can have some more last minute questions to ask me since it would have been five days between that review day and when our actual final is. Um, I have a, I have one, one question about the final. Um, is, are the, would, would the final questions be like, um, so you're, are you saying that they're like the quiz questions just with like randomized numbers or are they completely separate? They will be very much like what we've seen before. Okay with randomized numbers. So there may be, as I've mentioned, there may be a problem where I've got an application where you maximize something. And so it may be different words, not just different numbers in the problem, but it's still the same idea. We're still doing the same maximize thing. So yeah, I've had you? students in the past that have said, well, we didn't have a problem like this. And I say, well, yeah, it's like this. And they'll say things like, Oh, but that one was maximize the number of oranges we sell, and this one was maximize number of seats. I'm like, it's the same problem. So sometimes there's a little difference between what I consider to be the same and what students do, but I, but it's it's testing the same concept. So, so I know we didn't get test number two back. Can you post? Yeah, no, test? I, yeah, I just, I actually just got a, um, a, a, a chat that says that, that says exactly what you said. Since we didn't get our exam two back, will there be a few practice problems posted or should we just refer to the homework? And that's a good question. Um, I, one problem I have is the exams are on campus um, and I'm not allowed to go on campus. So I'm going to have a tough time getting those to send to you. So I think probably the best bet would be that I do some practice problems online for that. Okay. Um, I think that's pretty much my only, my only choice at this point, unless they open up campus again. And then I still don't know how I would get you your tests. Um, so yeah, I'll probably not not our test that we you graded. Can you put a blank? Do you have a blank test of the test number two that we took? Oh yeah, that I could do. That's that's what I was talking about. I don't care oh. about my test. Yeah, can you? Oh no, that's version? a good point. Oh yeah, that because that would be similar to, yeah, yeah. yeah maybe with some answers do there too, so we can check our work. <laughs> <laughs> answers uh, are optional, but that practice you guys test two more and more demanding. Great would be nice just because we got test number one back we did number three we're going to get number four technically we can print it out um that's the only reason so we can refer back to number right. two test yeah. you can put the answers if you want i don't care I think, <laughs> you know, as long as we get an idea of what's number two, the question question that yeah test number two questions are like yeah no that's a good point yeah i i very well may send out um the test and I just had a nice comment about that. <laughs> I appreciate that. Okay. Yeah, I will. And I'm writing myself a note right now to send out a copy of exam two. You'll be reminded. Don't worry. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. Huh? If you forget. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, let's see. Math 11. Okay. Excellent. All right. Anything else? All right. All right. I'm going to stop it here. Um, and so.
I think that's it. I hope you guys have a great weekend. It's already the weekend since it's Wednesday, I guess. And I will talk to you again on Monday. All right. Take have care. Have a good everybody. day. Have a good Thanks, day. you too. All right. Bye. Thank you, Professor. You're welcome.